Welcome to the 27th in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history. And this is the episode on the Russo-Turkish War. And for those who are familiar, please oblige me while I list out the rules. So I am not an academic presenter. I'm not uh, skilled, uh, sorry, I'm not accredited in history, religion, philosophy, or any of the things that we are going to be discussing tonight. But I will try to give this from a secular uh, pr uh, secular perspective, trying to give it from uh, a lens that matches uh, what we see more in the historical record. And given that this is a sensitive topic, like all topics related to history, especially as we get closer and closer to modernity, let's please be respectful of the topic. But that said, I cherish interactivity. Please put your questions, comments, clarifications in the chat. Or um, if you prefer to speak, um, uh, please raise your hand and I will call on you in due course. I design these as a 101 and a 201, meaning that if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if you know something, I'll probably tell you something you didn't know anyway. Um, I have a two hour hard stop, so I won't do any new slides after two hours. And um, I will continue to talk and answer questions, but we won't cover any new material. So you know that at the end of the two hours, you won't miss anything uh, if you leave. And finally, this is a recording like all of the other entrance in the series and you can watch it later uh, in order to uh, in order to uh, learn uh, even more or go over details that you may have missed. So this is the quiz for everybody who's been participating and to see what you remember from last week's discussion. So question number one, which three of the following statements are accurate descriptions of the Ottoman economy in the 1600s? A. The Ottoman Akce was a powerful currency and used in both the Habsburg Empire and the Republic of Venice due to its inherent stability. B, most Ottomans lived in small rural villages with few changes over the centuries. C, as European states were becoming more industrialized and building up their production capability, the Ottoman Empire rapidly brought in Europeans to industrialize the Balkans. D, as a result of Ottoman conquest in the Levant, Mesopotamia, and North Africa, the Timar system was spread as far south as Cairo and Baghdad. E, Christians in the Ottoman Empire had disproportionate weight in the Ottoman economy, being responsible for much of banking, shipping, and international trade. And F, the Ottomans requested key resources from tributary states like wheat from Moldavia or slaves from the Khanates of Crimea and Nogai. All right, let's see. B, E, and F. Very nice, Eugene. Uh, you got all three of them. That's fantastic. All right to go over everything. Um, the Ottoman Akce was not a powerful currency. In fact, the Ottoman Empire uh, routinely had its currency devalued and debased, uh, and the Venetian ducat was often uh, the currency of international trade. Um, Ottomans did live in small rural villages. Um, C is uh, incorrect because the Ottoman Empire didn't bring in Europeans to industrialize the Balkans, uh, at least in the 1600s. Um, D, uh, the Timar system only got as far south as Aleppo and Mosul. It never got further south than that. Um, e is correct because of the Amira class in the Armenians and the Fanariote class in the Greeks, uh, who were disproportionately responsible for international trade. And um, F is correct because um, the way that the Ottoman Empire exacted tribute from its vassal states was through uh, resource uh, provision as opposed to necessarily monetary taxes. Question number two, which of the following were major international exports of the Ottoman Empire? Choose all that apply. Uh, A, fertilizer, B, silk, C, pearls, D, lumber, E, slaves, F, spices, G, artisanry and manufacturers. All right, we've got some in the chat. I've got D, they didn't export lumber. Um, I've got F, F is correct, they exported spices, yeah, F. I've got B, silk, yep, C, pearls, yep. Uh, what else, E, uh, slaves, slaves were imported, not exported. Um, F and G, uh, G, uh, they did not export uh, artisanry and manufacturers. Um, most of these were less competitively made than those in Europe. Um, so we've got, yeah, fertilizer is not a right answer. Silk is a right answer. Pearls is a right answer. Lumber is not a right answer. Slaves is not a right answer. 
spices is a right answer and artisanry and manufacturers is not a right answer. So that's B, C, and F. Question number three. Which of the following best characterizes Fakhreddin the second Ma'an? A, he was a neo Mamluk in Cairo who started the production of sugarcane and rice in the Nile Valley, but was removed by, Sul uh, by Sultan Mehmed III before he could consolidate power. He was a Kurdish uh, Sunni Multazm, uh, meaning an owner of Indizem from coastal Syria who led a revolt against the Ottomans with the support of Tuscany as a potential crusade ally. He was a Druze Multazm who conquered most of Lebanon and agreed to protect the Maronite Christians, effectively Lebanon's founding father. Or D, he was a Turkish governor in Aleppo who was incensed with Kapriyu Mehmet Pasha's large-scale purges and revolted against his authority. And C, yeah, C is the correct answer. Well done, Patty. So um, yeah, we don't. Uh, I, I mentioned that the Neo Mamluks in Cairo um, were routinely um, uh, removed by Sultan Mehmet III, but I didn't give a name for any of these people. Uh, there, there were a large number of them. Um, he wasn't a Kurdish Sunni Multazm, and in fact, this description uh, really fits um, Ali Junbalad. Um, see, we mentioned he is the he's considered the founding father of Lebanon for making the Druze Maronite Pact, and D is false um, because this is the story um, of Abaza Pasha, who was the governor of Aleppo and executed in Aleppo in uh, in 1659 um, for. Uh, trying to uh, stand up to Kapriyu Mehmet. Okay, question number four. Uh, which of the following are true concerning the Ottoman wars during the Kapriyu period? Choose all that apply. A, the attempt by George II Rakoci of Transylvania to acquire land in Poland was ignored. The Ottoman siege at Candia was one of the longest and most expensive, expensive sieges in history. The second siege of Vienna would have been an Ottoman victory, but for the Polish cavalry. Kara Mustafa Pasha was able to acquire Polish territory as a result of the Polish-Ottoman War. The Ottomans launched three successive invasions of Safavid Persia, recovering Tabriz. The Ottomans sent their fleet to join the English and Dutch fleets against the Portuguese. The Battle of Zenta and the subsequent Treaty of Karlowitz were devastating blows to Ottoman power and put Hungary under the Habsburgs. We've got G. Um, G is definitely one of the correct answers. Yep, there are more, there's more than one correct answer though. I've got C as well. C is also a correct answer. There are some more actually out there. F, uh, F is actually an incorrect answer. The Ottomans did not send their fleet to join the English and the Dutch against the Portuguese. Uh, I've got E, um, yes. The Ottomans did launch successive inter, uh, invasions of Safavid Persia, um, but not in this period. So um, yeah, that's not the case. D is correct. Um, so right, B is correct. The Ottoman siege of Candia uh, was the second longest siege in history. Um, the longest belonged to one of the sieges that took place in Morocco. Um, the second siege of Vienna would have uh, uh, would have been an Ottoman victory, but for the Polish cavalry. We talked about that. The sappers were almost under the wall. Um, Karim Mustafa Pasha was part of the Polish-Ottoman War, where he uh, captured territory. Um, and uh, the Battle of Zenta and the su uh, subsequent Treaty of Karlowitz were devastating blows to Ottoman power and put Hungary under the Habsburgs. Those are all correct. Um, the Ottomans did not join the English and Dutch fleets, although they were very thankful that they uh, they fought uh, the Portuguese successfully. Um, and the attempt by George II Rakoci of Transylvania to acquire Poland was met with his swift removal. All right, in question number five, which of the following best describes the Ya'arubid Imamat of Oman? A. It was a confederation of Omani tribes led by the Ibadi Imam Nasir bin Murshid that consolidated the Omani coast, ejected the Portuguese, and then expanded to Africa. B, it was an Omani vassal state based in the Omani city of Nizwa that assisted the uh, Ottomans in controlling the Zaidi hill tribes in Yemen. C, it was a Safavid vassal that fought against the Ottomans to help enforce Shah Abbas's blockade of an Ottoman trade with India by cutting off the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, 
D, it was a sultanate based on the island of Zanzibar that besieged Fort Jesus in Mombasa before liberating the Omanis under Portuguese authority. Uh, B is not the correct answer. Do I have any other guesses? C is also not the correct answer. D is also not a correct answer. Um, so we've guessed all, <laughs> by process of elimination, Patrick, we have A being the correct answer. Uh, clearly, uh, <laughs> when we got to the end of the presentation, um, people's eyes may have been glazing over, which is why, which is why after two hours, we have to call it quits, right? All right. So one of the things that as we move into today's discussion that I want to sort of talk about is this is the point in history where we start seeing large scale massacres and targeted genocides. And so I wanted to establish three definitions that I would use here and use further on uh, in the series. I'll, I'll come back to it when when we have um, additional uh, additional cases. But the first thing is that if we go from least severe to most severe, we have the massacres, right? And the massacres are when we have a killing of civilians without the intent to exterminate. It's sort of a haphazard situation, right? All the civilians in town X are killed, but it's because of the fighting in the area and the local soldiers have sort of just chosen to do it, right? And then you have these local genocides where you have a local division of soldiers or government um, in, the, in a particular region that's choosing uh, to go after um, a specific targeted group, right? So there's intention behind it, but it doesn't uh, reach the highest levels of the national government. And then you have the state-led genocides where cases where there you have officials in the government making it clear that there's an intent to remove or exterminate a certain group of people. And we are going to see a number of all of these as I said today, and in the subsequent, and in some some of the subsequent presentations, um, as we get closer and closer to modernity. All right. Now, one of the things that we had discussed is that we have this millet system, and in this millet system, uh, you have representation by the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate for all of the Orthodox Christianities, right? We, uh, that includes the Greek Orthodox Church, that includes the uh, Aromanian Orthodox Church, um, all, uh, all the Slavic speaking Orthodox churches. Um, and so you have this unified leadership under the Greek Patriarch who is responsible for defending uh, these people before the Ottoman Sultan. And in the same vein, we have a similar uh, situation where the Armenians are representing numerous different uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianities with their Milith Basha, right? So we've got, for example, the Copts, the Assyrian uh, slash Syriac uh, churches, um, all of them being represented by the Armenian uh, Milith Basha. Um, and so you, and of course, the Jews had their own Milith. You have this uh, system which exists to empower within the empire these minority populations. And of course, the Orthodox population is by far the largest millet. Uh, some estimates put at this time around the year 1700 that Orthodox uh, Christians are one quarter of the empire's entire population. And we discussed how the way that they had this representation is through um, their leadership in Istanbul, specifically in the Fener district or Fanar district uh, for the Greeks, which is the, fun, uh, and you can see the Fanariotes in the upper right-hand side. And the Armenians were in the Kumkapa district, uh, which you can see in the lower, in the lower right-hand side. So we also discussed how during the Caprulu period that we had a number of changes to the Ottoman military. And these changes were to see really the end of Devshirme, that we don't have this process where young Christian boys are taken, forcibly converted to Islam, and then put into the Janissary Corps. The Janissary Corps is now expanded through an application process. So people um, who primarily are of Muslim ancestry in the Balkans, be it Albanians, Bosnians, um, or uh, Grecian Turks, um, these people are joining the Janissaries and being trained uh, in the ways of being a soldier. And 
This leads to a large shift in the Ottoman military. The Janissaries as a, mil as a musket bearing corps are more important, right, as you move into the 1700s than the Sipahi were, which were the light cavalry that dominated uh, about 400 years ago. And so you see the numbers of Sipahi decreasing and the numbers of Janissary significantly increasing. And this creates the interesting scenario where these Janissaries have families. They start marrying, right? Because they're free citizens. They're not uh, slaves through the Debshidimah system. So they, uh, so they have families and they begin to become entrenched in the local economy, which is something that the Janissaries were never supposed to do, right? The Janissaries were supposed to exclusively be loyal to the Sultan, which is why they were acquired through this slave process, right? Because that way they would have no loyalty to anyone but the Sultan. But now they have loyalty to their own families, their own communities, and to their own wealth production. Uh, the Janissaries begin to uh, either uh, generate money through uh, violence uh, against local populations, a, a sort of extortion racket, or uh, by creating their own businesses. Many of the coffee houses, um, and coffee house is not a euphemism here, it's, a, it's like a cafe. Um, many of the coffee houses that exist around the Ottoman Empire are founded by Janissaries because it's a great way to collect money. You also see that the Ottoman army includes these individuals called Sekban, and these Sekban are, non, uh, are usually nomadic peoples um, who are uh, given a rifle and basically told to uh, fight whenever a battle happens, and then after the battle, they are dismissed. And so they form what's called an irregular corps, right? They're not regular troops because they haven't been properly trained and organized. Aaron, if you could sort of clarify a little bit, why what would be a problem of bringing irregular troops into battle instead of uh, using regular troops? So the one of the challenges or one of the benefits is obviously you uh, aren't spending a huge amount of uh, resources in having a standing army and having a huge amount of, uh, of uh, management and force structure and, and resources and also having a competent force that could uh, actually uh, uh, challenge your, your authority. The flip side is when you have to go to the uh, to the battle, you have this extremely inconsistent uh, group. And on average, you have somewhere in the order of 30 to 60% who don't, just don't even show up um, or um, are not necessarily uh, competent at engaging um, and, and then also don't have even a similar language um, to engage. So your communications, you know, it really almost everything breaks down so they're, they're really actually almost a great force for civilian suppression. But once you start taking on more competent standing uh, armies, they, uh, you know, they sort of wither away. Uh, and that's pretty consistent in irregular forces over time. And especially, uh, you know, with the, the Turkey Ottomans and, and then having a lot of sort of diffused populations uh, made it even worse. Uh, because many people didn't uh, even in, know what they were fighting for and, um, yeah. and so on. No, in, in many cases, the irregular forces in the Ottoman military were from Yurik tribesmen or other Turkic tribesmen exactly. who had their own dialect of Turkish, which was different than the Turkish being used by the Ottomans, especially since the Ottoman Turkish had a lot of Persian words in it, um, especially where complex terms were concerned. And so... There were a yeah, lot and of they also had a Turkish command. Turkish. They called it command Turkish, which was that Persian Turkish, which of course, you know, was obviously a much more sophisticated and literate form that, you know, those Turkish local commanders probably had no idea what they were saying half the time. Right. So now we sort of have to understand a little bit of where Russia is coming from with regards to this war. So this is a map of Eastern Europe in 1550. And we have to understand by this point, Russia has been subjected to a number of horrors from the Mongol invasions that took place about three centuries ago. Um, and those Mongol invasions turned Russia into a dependency of the Golden Horde. Eventually, the Russians were able to free themselves. Um, anyway, so you have this situation where Russia is trying to expand um, against 
uh, all of the remnants of the Golden Horde, all of these small conates that have developed as a result of the Golden Horde fragmenting and who still have some lasting pull uh, on Russia and are a serious threat to Russia. So if you look on the map, you can see Russia is there um, in the area that we think of as Russia, but to its east, there's another uh, slightly green country and that's the Kazan Khanate. And so that really becomes the target of Russia's first ambition is to take out these Kazan um, who are a Turkic group, a Muslim Turkic group um, who have really uh, taken on the mantle of what's left of the Golden Horde. And Ivan IV uh, really consolidates Russian power in the region by defeating the, uh, the Kazan Khanate and acquiring all of their territories. You can see um, the triumph of uh, the Tsar uh, when he enters the city and you have the local population uh, bowing to him. Now, Russia was an Orthodox Christian state and had declared itself to be, um, by this point, the successor state uh, to the fallen Constantinople. Remember, Constantinople fell about a century earlier in 1453. And so they considered themselves the third Rome, right? Rome was the first Rome, Constantinople was the second Rome, Russia was now the third Rome. And so they had a duty to protect and preserve Orthodox Christianity, which was the religion of Rome. So we had this now interesting relationship where we had a majority Muslim state now falling under Russian power. And the Russians had to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and they let Muslims generally practice their faith, but they did keep them under more surveillance than they did their own subjects. And there were cases where they had where they tried to tone what the imams were saying, what the imams were doing, in order to create a message that wouldn't directly conflict with the power of the Tsar. We then see from the Russian side that they were expanding further south. After they had defeated Kazan, they moved towards uh, the city of Astrakhan. Um, and they besieged the city uh, pretty early on in 1568. Now, the Ottomans noticed the Russians moving further south and wanted to cut them off, as we've discussed during the reign of Selim II. And so Sokolo Mehmed uh, Pasha brought an army to attack the, Ru the new Russian position, barely two years old at Astrakhan. But the thing is, is that the Ottomans were not able to bring their full strength to bear on this city. Their fleet was destroyed just outside of Azov, in the Sea of Azov, and many of their troops had difficulty crossing the Caucasus mountain range, which you can see on this map separates Georgia uh, from the southernmost part of Russia. Because of this, the Russians were able to defend their position. And furthermore, they in the Battle of Molodi in 1572, they were able to deal a decisive uh, victory, um, sorry, a decisive defeat to the Crimean Khanate, which was the Ottoman vassal in the area and based in the peninsula of Crimea. This led to Tsar Ivan Grozny, Tsar Ivan the Terrible, being able to consolidate his power uh, in this part of Russia. And for the first time, create a situation where the Ottoman Empire was going to be in, lock, in loggerheads with the expanding Russian power. All right. Um, we also talked about how uh, the Russians appropriated the Cossacks. So you had this Zaporozhian host and they were always looking for new allies uh, in their war against the Poles in order to achieve their own independence. Now, Cossacks are a sort of interesting situation. And um, and the Cossacks are an interesting situation uh, because these are Russian settlers who sort of move to the edge of Russian space and they find a way to make it work. They become these sort of nomadic, uh, they become these sort of nomadic uh, horsemen um, who begin to have their own ideals of expansion and territorial control that are outside 
of Russia's necessary grasp. We can think about this in many ways, like the Americans who settled the Wild West. They began to form their own militias. They began to uh, attack the other local populations to acquire more land. Um, and somehow the United States would be dragged into these conflicts uh, by those local populations. It's the same thing that happens here with the Zaporozhian host. Um, the Russians are dragged into uh, their wars, but at the same time, um, these groups end up fighting for Russian expansion, which is the goal of the Russians as well. So you have this sort of weird exchange. Uh, Aaron, do you want to comment on this a little bit? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think a couple things that, I mean, did you want me to go into sort of the, the military um, sure. uh, balance issues? Yeah, so I think one of the things to, to recognize is that, um, the Russians were uh, very sophisticated at, at, at determining how to uh, acquire Cossacks and Poles as, a, as their version of an irregular or you know, a, a supporting force uh, that was more organized, uh, that was uh, uh, definitely far more uh, equipped and battle led, and, and especially in a style of fighting which you know focused on sabers, spears, um, and you know had archers, and and but weren't emphasizing archery, right? So you know there's this little um, shift in the approach to uh, fighting, and 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 actually in the Battle of uh, Molody, you you see that actually because it's one of the reasons that the that the Russians were so successful, even though they were outmanned two to three to one is that the um is, is that is that basically um you know the the horde um uh well the the way that the russians expected to fight versus what the turkish expected was fundamentally different and so you had a much more closed in um you know the way you would think of sort of the movie william wallace style of of, of fighting and, and the Russians were much more prepared for that. And as you are on these step areas, you find there's, there's, there's more terrain driven fighting like that. And so when you mix what the Russians were doing by acquiring basically battle hardened irregulars on top of their expanding forces, um, it started to position them for a, you know, in essence, a much more powerful kinetic uh, land army um, you know, and, and I would say very much on par with what you saw with French and English armies at, 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 at a similar point in time. And they're not necessarily credited that way. And, and I think they should be. And as we see with the successes they have, uh, I think it's pretty clear. Absolutely. Is, that, is that good enough, for Richard? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Richard, okay. um, and when it comes to co-optation, we see um, this process occurring slowly but surely. So, um, for example, we start with Hetman Petro Doroshenko. Doroshenko um, was Hetman or the leading commander um, because um, the Zaporozhian host were led uh, from the Sikh. You can see the Sikh uh, in the lower right-hand side. Um, and the Sikh would appoint a Hetman uh, through the vote of the Cossacks. And so Petro Doroshenko was, uh, was the leading Hetman. And he decided to make common cause with the Ottomans. And so in 1676, the Russians supported a rival candidate and had uh, Petro Doroshenko uh, removed from, uh, from power as hetman, uh, which already shows the beginning of Russian influence. And we have a number of battles, for example, the battles of Shehurin. Um, first, uh, first the, uh, the, Russian, the Russians uh, managed to uh, sorry, the Ottomans managed to take the fortress, then the Russian forces managed to eject them in 1678. Now I have a question, is the strategic array deployment also on par with those other militaries too? The Cossacks were not strategically deployed. Um, I think you sort of have to think about them like you would think about the American settlers uh, in the Wild West, right? You could say that their position was strategic in that they were ho helping to advance the entity that is the United States further and further west uh, into 
to the heartland of the continent. But it's not like they can be strategically moved at a moment's whim, you know, to cut off a, an important pass or something like that. Um, so that, that was the way that the Cossacks were helpful. They were on that frontier land. They were um, helping, uh, in, in a very clear sense, Russia to uh, counter its threats to the south. And, and I think one thing that is um, not understood is the, is the absolutely strategic importance of the Battle of uh, Chittagin is that, you know, it really stopped the Western expanse of the Ottomans into ultimately what would have been Poland and Hungary, um, you know, which is one of those, like the Battle of Tours, it's, you know, it's, it's in the big leagues of really important moments, whether anyone understood that then is sort of irrelevant, is that it, 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 it was one of those turning points uh, that if that didn't happen, you, you would have had a, a radically different um, development. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things uh, that are relevant today. Uh, so this is what they call, uh, just a little bit deciphering the name. Uh, it's called Zaporozhka uh, uh, Sich. That means that uh, this is the uh, lower uh, Dnieper River. That's where it's formed. Uh, and uh, uh, porog, it means uh, uh, the, um, how you call it, um, you know, uh, you know, when the water goes down, uh, uh, you know, when the- Yeah, low tide. Low, low tide, yeah. Uh, yeah, when there are uh, stones, when there is some, uh, some fall, uh, you know, so that, that was, but the whole idea is that this is the basis of the kind of Ukrainian nation because the Ukrainians re really goes that these are the founders of this new Ukrainian. Uh, of course, they, they often want to claim that they Kiev and uh, uh, Russia also was a foundation, but at least this new formation uh, 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 of uh, uh, foundation of the new Ukrainian identity goes to these people. They often served as a buffer uh, and they often served Russia, Poland, even Turks sometimes, they, they fought all of them uh, at different times, but they use them as a buffer, um, the various nations uh, at different times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the Eastern side, you have the part of the Zaporozhian host that is controlled by the Russians. And on the Western side, you have one that's more aligned with either the Poles or the Ottomans, depending on the period, more often the Ottomans. And so you have this continual sort of civil war between the Zaporozhian host, um, as the Russians try to link, uh, make their candidate the Hetman, and the Ottomans try to make their candidate the Hetman. Um, eventually, we have the final seriously independent Hetman, which was Ivan Mazepa. Uh, but, after, uh, but after he was uh, removed in 1708, um, basically the Zaporozhian host became incorporated into uh, Russia's orbit. And in 1775, uh, Catherine the Great actually destroyed the Zaporozhian Sikh um, because, uh, because the Zaporozhians had now become part of the Russian Empire. Now, I have a question as to whether the Cossacks were not tactically sophisticated. Um, I would say that for an irregular force, they were tactically sophisticated, um, but I wouldn't say that they were anything close to the trained militaries um, if you were to put them in a one-on-one -on -one engagement. Yeah, no, we're, absolutely. We're, and, as, and especially if you look at the Turks, but so th this is a question of sort of matching, right? So the Turks came into fights with their horses, with their artillery, with, you know, with things that they believed where they were because they were effective where they were in the Mediterranean. Uh, or the upper Mediterranean area, uh, but as they came into these low and highlands, um, you know, uh, almost in a similar fashion to the way, not to have to try to bring things back to the U.S. always, but to the way that the that the British tried to fight the American irregulars uh, uh, in the in the South, where they were, you know, in you know uh, horses, um, you know, uh, traditional English French fighting. Uh, uh, formations, and they were fighting these very dynamic, irregular, um, 
uh, uh, forces. And it's very, very, very similar, actually, in, in a much larger context. It's, it's important that we, we, we live in this uh, situation right now, political situation. And, and, and uh, there is a lot of his history given by Putin, for instance. Uh, the official unification considered of Ukraine and Russia happened in 1654, at the time of uh, Tsar Alexius. Uh, Romanov, it's a second of Romanov Tsars. Uh, and uh, in the city of Kriyaslav, it was the agreement side. And the big part of it was uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, which is considered to be a like, national hero, who actually fought on all sides through his mm. career. He has been in the captivity in Turkey. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire. He was a captive there. He was brought out. He then fought uh, uh, for Poles. Uh, uh, and then he fought, uh, fought against Poles, and, and eventually uh, he asked Russians. Uh, they realized they cannot. Uh, they, they wanted independence, but they couldn't. Uh, they realized they can't have an independence on their own. They asked the Russian Tsar to help them, uh, and uh, uh, this help uh, uh, actually developed into uh, uh, that they became part of Russian Empire, uh, yeah. and that officially how uh, Ukraine was united uh, with the Russian Empire because prior to that, uh, it belonged to uh, Lithuania, uh, this area, and eventually Lithuania united with Poland. And, and, and at the time of this uh, event, it was, um, the Ukraine was part of the Poland. Uh, uh, I mean, there are no def uh, defined borders of what Ukraine were at the time. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. So, and of course, you can imagine today with the heightened situation between Ukraine and Russia, a lot of people are sort of focusing a little bit on this past of was Ukraine's accession to Russia, this Zaporozhian's host accession to Russia um, uh, meant uh, to be the current situation that the two states have where they're, where they're very strongly linked or not. Um, but what's important to understand is that after uh, we deal with the Zaporozhian host, we have to sort of seal with the fact that Russia in this time is actually modernizing. So there are several different things that, um, uh, Greg, can you say what year um, uh, was the per uh, Perestavl agreement? It was 1654? 54, yes. right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, 1654. All right, there you go, uh, Christina. Um, so... Now you have this Tsar Peter who comes to power in 1682 and he comes to power as a young man. He's also spent years in Western Europe to try and learn what it is that would make Russia uh, more advanced uh, technologically and socially. And so when he comes to Russia, uh, he begins a vast modernization effort. Uh, the first thing that he does is he goes to the boyars who are the traditional nobility of Russia and from whom the Russians had whom the Russian Tsar had to placate typically in order to organize the country. In many ways, we can see this as re relatively similar to the system of governors and janissaries that we've seen in the Ottoman Empire, where it's not just the Sultan making decisions, but you have a lot of vested interested parties. And what Peter does to these boyars is he shaves them, makes them uh, wear Western clothes, limits their power substantially, um, and organizes his state much closer to an absolutist style. And that's not to say that he was uh, very much loved for this. In fact, many of the military divisions uh, in the Russian empire revolted, uh, including the Strelsi, which were a historic uh, military division. And after they revolted, um, uh, tsar, the Tsar executed them and created a standing army. Now, this was a standing army based on recruitment, right? This is the modern way armies are created through large scale drafts and recruitment and then following that with training. And so, and it wasn't just uh, the Strelsi that uh, Peter the Great had to put down. He had to put down revolts from minority groups like the Bashkir, uh, which were a Muslim group uh, near to where the Khanate of Khazan, Khazan um, uh sorry, uh, was located. And so it was one of the different uh, Turkic Tatar nations that existed there. And of course, Peter had another major ambition, which was to acquire a warm water port. Uh, Russia was this massive landlocked country. Um, there were some ports in the north, like Akhangelsk, but these ports were cold water ports that would freeze over in the winter. And so they wanted a port that they could operate year round, and it was Peter's ambition to either get one in the north 
uh, which he eventually did get when he took Saint Peter, the territory that is now Saint Petersburg, uh, from the Swedes, uh, who were controlling it at that time. And you'll see he tries to do it in the south as well, which directly conflicts with Ottoman interests. Um, the Russians also uh, sponsored basically naval raiding also on the Ottoman trade, which was a nuisance, obviously, but you know cumulative because of how dependent uh, they were on on trade and tax receipts, um, and and basically on pat it was like rent seeking on passing the costs on to the traders. But as the traders would lose, you know maybe an average of 30% and then the taxes, everything else, it, it obviously was pretty unmotivating to become a, a, a shipper. International merchant. Yeah, exactly. Then we talked about the siege of Vienna, which launches the war with the Holy League that the Russians participate in to the extent that the Russians participate in the war of the Holy League. Um, they are primarily concerned with getting Azov, um, Azov being uh, that sea that exists between the peninsula of Crimea and the mainland of Europe. You can see that on the map uh, in the lower part. And the Russians uh, uh, launched two sets of campaigns. The first one is a failure in 1695, and the second one with an amphibious landing is successful in 1696. Um, and they established the first warm water port in Russian history. Uh, St. Petersburg was taken a few years later. So this is the city of Taganrog. And, and one thing to recognize is that the scale of this, um, of, of the second uh, campaign and uh, of, it, of the amphibious landing is, is, is pretty remarkable actually uh, in, in historical terms. Um, and, and, and I think that's the big thing to recognize is that the, the velocity of Russia's industrialization of their army, um, I mean, it, they were making leaps in, in measured in years, whereas others were making leaps measured in decades, or in some cases, maybe almost half a century. And, and, and so they, would, uh, acqu they wouldn't know how to do something like an amphibious assault 20 years earlier and 20 years later you know, they, they could put a, a fleet of ships, you know, in a, in a force of 75,000 and, and bring a, a fleet of, of, you know, 30 plus, uh, you know, 30 to 50 vessels and 4,000 um, uh, amphibious landing uh, troops, which is astronomical. Uh, and, and that is just an incredible level of competence and innovation. And, and I think a a piece that doesn't get enough credit is the development of their high command, right? They're building a professional cadre or the, or the process of building a professional cadre. I have a question about the painting. I believe that this painting is relatively contemporaneous, but by relatively contemporaneous, I think it was a century later that it was painted. Yeah, um, Robert Kerr Porter. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, one part that I didn't mention, and it was more on the Austrian side of the War of the Holy League, is that when uh, Charles V, Duke of, Lor of Lorraine, took Buda Castle, um, he massacred um, the Turkish uh, people that he found. And what he considered Turks uh, included both Muslims and Jews, um, because those populations were seen as being loyal to the Ottoman state and disloyal to a Catholic Hungary. Um, and so you start having the beginnings of these massacres um, where the more territory that was formerly Ottoman comes into uh, Christian hands, the more stories Muslim, of Muslims and Jews uh, running in further inward to the Ottoman Empire that create fear of the possibility of that takeover uh, in terms of its disruptive nature to their lives. Um, I have a question, didn't the Ukrainians beget the, beget the Russians? The Kievan Rus was the first Russian civilization. And so the Kievan Rus was based obviously in Kiev. So Ukrainians take credit for that as, as do the Russians because it is the progenitor of both of them. But um, when we talk about the modern conception of Ukraine, uh, its current national symbols and ideals, we, we trace it to the Zaporozhian host, uh, not all the way back to the Kievan Rus, even though that is the antecedent. 
it would be like saying the modern conception of the United States is based on the American Revolution. It's not based on the English Civil War, for example, despite the fact that most of the people who fought in the American Revolution would have had ancestors that were around in England during the English Civil War. All right. Yep, I agree. By the way, just wanted to mention that you said Buddha, uh, Buddha Castle, it's a part of the Budapest nowadays uh, because mm -hmm. there were two cities on the eastern uh, bank is a Buddha, on the western is Pest, and that's what the city of Budapest right now is. Absolutely. And, the cities and, and, simply okay. weren't united at that time. And, and one other thing, um, that after uh, the successful uh, uh, campaign on, uh, on, on Azov, October 20th, uh, 1696 is the creation of the Imperial Russian Navy. Um, and it's considered sort of the, it's the birth date. And that, uh, uh, Putin has brought that back uh, to, you know, reemphasize obviously the, the, the lineage. Um, and one thing to recognize that the first, that the first shipbuilding program was for over 50 ships, which was extremely large. I mean, I, I just, I can't emphasize what a, a powerfully exploding empire at this point in, over these, these, these singular years that Russia was becoming, um, you know, and, and, and I think uh, the only corollary you could have in the modern world would be what, what, what's happened in China the last 40 years. I mean, it's just yeah. Russia was developing into this. And you also, you know, truly, and the other thing that we should point out with the shipbuilding is that while Russia had numerous rivers in which to build ships, an ocean going vessel is not the same as a, as a river going right. vessel. And so Peter the Great had to bring this know-how that he'd acquired in the Netherlands concerning how to build ships uh, to uh, Togenrog and teach the, teach the Russians who were there to build on this kind of massive scale. Right. So it's not only that the build order was huge, <clears throat> but the build order was something that the Russians had never even achieved once successfully. That's right. And, um, and, and, and not to, to, to minimize it, to have it right at the doorstep of the Ottoman Lake. So, yep. I mean, you are, you are right at the tip of the spear uh, in and relative can... terms and developing a, you know, a, a, a modern peer adversary Navy simultaneously. I mean, it, I, have a, it was... I have a question. Where is Go this? Ahead. Are you talking about Togenrog? Uh, if you look on the map here, um, you can see that uh, point that's sort of at the Northeastern corner of the Sea of Azov. That is where the city of Togenrog uh, was at that time and still is today. And then I have a comment that Kiev was the capital of the Russian Empire. Um, this was during the time of the Kievan Rus. There, are, uh, as far as I'm aware, there was no point after which uh, Moscovy was ascendant that uh, Moscow or Saint Petersburg was not the capital of yeah, Russia. It, it, it was not an empire during the time of Kiev. It was just a princedom. Uh, yeah. That with the centering of Kiev. So, and uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's entirely kind of different civilization that been, uh, I mean, on that, it was built, uh, all of those um, states, uh, the Ukraine and Russia, um, uh, eventually after, uh, but Moscow uh, started to develop uh, only in 14th century um, as a dominating uh, princedom uh, uh, coming out of the uh, uh, Mongol yoke. Exactly. So now this uh, Treaty of Karlowitz in 1699, as we mentioned, this was a huge turning point in Ottoman history. And it's a huge turning point because for the first time, the Ottoman Empire is on the receiving end of a large scale war that defeats it quite severely and takes away significant amounts of territory. But even more than that, the Ottoman Empire is now forced to exist in the European understanding of nation states um, and uh, sorry, of nations, not nation states, of nations. And so they have to treat in the sense of writing treaties as equal parties through discussion and diplomacy. This was something that had developed in Europe in 1648 during the Peace of Westphalia after the Thirty Years' War. But the Ottoman Empire got it 50 years later and therefore was 50 years behind the eight ball in terms of how to negotiate and how to best take advantage of this information. To add insult to injury, none of the Turkish leadership in the Ottoman Empire spoke foreign languages, right? So that's why we had, uh, if you see on the upper right-hand side, Alexandros Mavrokorbatos, who was the who was a Greek uh, fanariot in, in Istanbul, um, 
And he was the Ottoman dragoman. He was the translator who spoke in Italian uh, and negotiated the Treaty of Karlowitz from the Ottoman side. Um, the only reason he knew Italian was because when he was studying to be a doctor, he had to go to the University of Bologna in Northern Italy. So he learned Italian, but he wasn't a diplomat by training. He wasn't organized. And so you can see that the Russian empire is about two years ahead of the eight ball and the Ottoman empire is about 50 years behind, um, which, uh, which further uh, shows the issues with their, uh, confrontation. And if you also look at the losses under the Treaty of Karlowitz, you can see that little red block at the north, northeastern coast of the Sea of Azov, which of course is Toganrog. So one of the things that we have to discuss in this period is that there is a theory that if, and you've pro you're probably familiar with this theory if you went to high school sometime before 1990, which I think is all of us in this meeting, um, there is this idea uh, called the Ottoman decline thesis, which is that from 1566, when Suleiman I died, until 1923, uh, when the Ottoman Empire is abolished, um, that the Ottoman Empire was in a state of decline and that it, it was inexorable that the, that the countries of Europe would defeat the Ottoman Empire and destroy it. And this argument is very teleological in the sense of it has, a, it has a final goal and it sort of fits the reality to move towards this goal. But there's very little evidence in terms of how the Ottoman Empire was structured that before the late 1800s, that the Ottoman Empire was really declining. It's more that it was transforming. It's not that it's declining, it's that it's not moving forward fast enough. So one of the things that we've uh, noticed as we do more and more research into this period is that the Ottoman Empire from a military and logistic standpoint is relatively self-sufficient. The Ottoman Empire is producing most of its own guns, if not all of them, most of its own artilleries and most of its own uh, highways in terms of transportation of these weapons to the battlefields. So the Ottoman Empire is perfectly capable of taking care of itself. There's also this pervading view that the ulama or the religious educated elite were stopping every single um, innovation or modernization. And while they did stop some, um, generally speaking, they were not as massive a, um, a conservative force and far more important in retarding the development of the military was actually the Janissaries, right? The remaining members of the, mil of, of the current military who didn't want change to occur because it might weaken their position. So while we have some opposition from the ulama, it, there's not this massive conservative push uh, from them to keep the Ottoman Empire declining. And in fact, if we look at the Ottoman Empire from a bureaucratic perspective, it's transforming from a military expansionist empire to a bureaucratic empire. Um, the Ottoman Empire is doing relatively well. It's generating um, large scale tax revenues, the kinds of um, mass inflation that occurred at the end of the 16th century aren't occurring anymore. Um, you have relatively solid control of land. And you can see that this map from 1800 doesn't look that different than the Treaty of Karlowitz map, which uh, just to show you, looks like that. So it's, so in that 100 years, the Ottoman Empire really doesn't lose much land. Um, and it's, and uh, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, the Ottoman Empire simply transformed from an aggressive power to a defensive power. Um, well, and, and, and I think a key thing is that they wound up having that sort of split within their um, leadership and administrative culture uh, where the, let's call it the business side evolved and became extremely dynamic, but the military side um, really struggled um, and ultimately failed to sort of recognize the the innovations that were occurring and to start to adjust and adapt. Uh, more importantly, <clears throat> organize itself to fight proportional to each enemy, right? Absolutely. So that, that became very important. That was a big evolution is that you just didn't fight everyone the same way, but you, you, would, you would fight different ad adversaries on, in, in different uh, topography or environmentals differently. And they really ultimately failed at that and struggled at that.
Now, one thing I wanted to point out, again, uh, on this transformation thesis, if you look, what happened to Western Europe, especially England and France, is that their economies soared uh, from the year 1500 until the year 1800, right? Uh, you can see France, uh, we're talking orders of magnitude larger than they were. If you look at the Ottoman Empire, we have actually a slow increase. Um, we have a slight decrease between 1750 and 1780, but the Ottoman Empire remains relatively steady. We see um, Venice also remains relatively steady. Um, so it's not that the Ottoman Empire um, was in decline, it's just that it wasn't growing in the same way that Western Europe was growing. Uh, there's a question about the word telos inside the Greek piece. Uh, the term telos is a Greek term, uh, meaning the end or the purpose of something. Um, and so uh, that was just to remind me that the Ottoman decline thesis is teleological. Now, the Ottomans weren't blind. They knew that they needed to do something. And so they, and so they began to try a few things. Um, this was led by Ahmed III. Now you have to realize just how powerful the Janissaries were at this period. Um, and I think you can say the Janissaries giveth and the Janissaries taketh away, right? Uh, they can, and they were the ones who put Ahmed III in power. And so he did have to tread very lightly with regards to uh, changing the Ottoman system. The first thing that he tried to do was create the Levand. And the Levand or Levandler were, were soldiers that were drafted from the local population, very similar to what Peter the Great was doing in Russia. The problem, of course, was that the Janissaries did not like uh, this system. And uh, Ahmed III wanted to teach these Levandler how to fight in a normal uh, drill style in an Ottoman military school. And so he began to found such schools um, and, and, and teach the Levandler um, how to uh, improve. The Janissaries, uh, in order to preserve their power, began to shut these schools down. You had these uh, soldiers and the Janissaries were generally opposed to them. And so while they did get some play, uh, these schools were eventually closed down. Um, and to the extent that they had European teachers who could explain these new modern European methods, they were few and far between. Um, I have a question that uh, the Venetian and Ottoman economy suffered a bit from the Portuguese going directly to Asia for spices, cutting them out. Uh, why doesn't this show in the chart? Um, because the economies compensated in other ways. Um, there were, uh, especially the Ottomans uh, began trading more silk because they started producing domestically. Um, now, in terms of what was going on in Ahmed III's uh, territory, he was also a patron of the arts. And so we see the Rococo period um, showing up in Ottoman architecture uh, during this period, the few things that survive. Uh, for example, we have the fountain of Ahmed III at Topkapı, and you can see uh, that sort of Rococo styling uh, in sort of an Islamic context um, uh, displayed there. And also he was fond of tulips. Um, tulip mania, which of course was uh, also a problem in the Netherlands where it caused a uh, massive, uh, it was probably the first uh, economic collapse related to uh, speculation in history. Um, and the Ottoman Empire loved the flower too. Um, so Ahmed III was not all about, uh, was not all guns, there were a few roses. Yeah. In 1700, um, there was a separate treaty signed between the Ottoman Empire and the Russians uh, called the Treaty of Constantinople, which would provide the Russians some degree of uh, permission to trade from the Black Sea out into the Mediterranean, right? They'd have to pass through the Turkish Straits and that permission was granted to them. However, um, Peter the Great decided to press his luck and uh, try to annex Moldavian territory uh, to uh, either Russia or to guarantee its independence. And so he began a march through Moldavia and the Ottoman army met him uh, on the Prut River. The Ottoman army that met him was composed partially of these Levedler, uh, along with the Janissaries, and they effectively defeated the Ottomans, uh, pushing them back um, to the north um, and making Peter the Great have to give up uh, his recently acquired territory on the, on the Sea of Azov. That city of Togenrog uh, went back to Ottoman control, and the Russians were once again landlocked in the south. 
At the same time, because of the uh, the war with the Holy League, the Venetians got control of the Peloponnesos, which is that area of Greece um, that is south of Athens. Now, the Peloponnesos was divided by the Venetians into several territories, but the thing is that they had very few people that could effectively control it. So you had very defensible castles with only a few hundred or a few thousand men defending them, and the Ottomans literally just walked right across uh, the Peloponnesos and took the territory in little more than a month. You know, there's an argument that's been made that uh, that the commander, uh, 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 Mahmoud uh, Pasha, he made a strategic error by basically signing that that treaty and made the, the, the terms easy for Russia versus just pursuing Peter the Great and trying to capture him. I mean, that, that talk about a counterfactual in history. I mean, that would have been a, you know, historically. Uh, that would have been a game changer. Game changer. Cause you, you tend to see that in history when it does happen, you have a fortuitous fall. So, you know, there, there, and, and one thing to recognize about that campaign that the Ottomans, one thing they did learn is the lesson of Azov of not of 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 having too small of a of a garrison. So when when they fought um, when they fought in the Pruth campaign, they had over two hundred thousand, uh, and the Russians had around fifty thousand. So it was about a four to one ratio. Uh, so you know, it, and and they really prepared. They prepared logistically. Um, they, they really scouted uh, where they wanted to fight. Uh, so they, they actually were very, very prepared. And, and arguably, Pasha is probably one of the great underrated military leaders of this whole era. I mean, he, he, he was also the commander of the, of the Ottoman fleet. I mean, he was a pretty historically uh, powerful commander, some, someone worth studying, actually. But uh, anyways, just something I wanted to bring up there about about how tenuous that campaign could have been for Peter the Great, basically. Now, on the Eastern Front, um, and we're going to discuss this a lot more, um, either later in March or earlier in April, when we get to uh, the Persian uh, 18th century, which is very volatile, um, you have the uh, Safavids that we learned about in the 21st episode um, collapsing in the early 1700s, and they're replaced by a number of Ghilji, uh tribesmen. You can see the Ghilji, um in the lower left-hand side. Uh, these Ghilji declare themselves as the Hotaki, um, uh, Hotaki kingdom. And um, because of the weakness of the Hotakis, the Ottoman Empire expands significantly eastward, uh, re-establishing a presence in uh, the Southern Caucasus, especially the Eastern parts of Georgia, what's now Azerbaijan and Iranian Azerbaijan as well. In, at the same time, because of uh, the Hotaki's weakness, the Russians also uh, pushed further south in their own war in 1723. And this means that the Russians are now incredibly close to the Ottomans and this will create a large amount of friction between the two empires. Just as a quick note, um, on, on the map on the right-hand side, you can see something that looks Russian that actually touches the Ottoman Empire. That is the kingdom of, uh, of Kartli in Georgia, um, which was not technically part of the Russian Empire, but it was an ally. That's why it was colored that way on the map. So this was the first time now that the Ottoman Empire has a clear border uh, with Russia uh, outside of uh, outside of Europe, so this uh, further exacerbates tensions as the Russians are trying to expand into the Caucasus. Now we have the Austro-Russo-Turkish War. Um, you you figure with that many combatants, they would have come up with a better name, but um, this war was over the future of Crimea, and um, the Russians uh, stormed uh, the Crimean Khanate's capital of Bakhchasaray. Um, and ironically, this is the only uh, Crimean palace that still survives in Russian territory, Russian slash Ukrainian territory. And um, this war was incredibly brutal. Um, 
In particular, uh, the Ottomans scored numerous victories against the Austrians in this war. The Austrians could barely win a battle. Um, and you can see, for example, the Battle of Grotzka, um, where the Ottoman forces uh, thoroughly defeated uh, the Austrians and were able to push further north and take Belgrade back. Belgrade had uh, slipped into Austrian control um, in several of the previous decades. And so uh, this, re uh, this restored Ottoman power in that region. The Russians were able to make a number of gains. In fact, almost every battle the Russians fought was a victory. That said, there was an incredible amount of disease that spread in the Russian camps. Um, and so, for example, there was the Fort of Ochakov, um, which is in modern day Ukraine. Um, and this fort was successfully held by the Russians against several Ottoman attempts to retake the fort. But eventually the Russians, the Russian garrison got so low, it's, a, it's believed that they lost 60,000 people to disease, um, that they just raised the fort and abandoned it um, because they couldn't afford to hold the garrison uh, with that situation. So um, because the Austrians were doing so poorly, they signed a Treaty of Belgrade in 1739, which confirmed that the Ottoman Empire would control Serbia um, up to Belgrade, up to the uh, Danube River. And when the Austrians pulled out, the Russians also pulled out um, because they had to deal with Sweden in the north and they couldn't continue a war against the Ottomans um, if they did not have their allies in the field. So this ended up being a victory for the Ottomans against both sides. And they signed that treaty in the city of Nish, which, was un which is a Serbian city under Ottoman control. There's also a very famous battle during this war um, about an island that sits in the middle of the Danube River. It's currently controlled by Romania, but it's on the Romanian um, border with Bulgaria, and it's the island of Adakale. This island had a majority Turkish population because, as you can imagine, all the territories in the Ottoman Empire were relatively ethnically mixed, especially those that were close to Romania had more Turkish population uh, than we would expect to find there today. And so this town um, was a Turkish town. It had been briefly occupied by the Russians and then the Ottomans launched an amphibious assault in the river uh, to take the city back, which was successful. Adakale actually remained a majority um, Turkish town um, until damming of the river uh, in the 1960s required people to abandon the city. Um, unfortunately, uh, that community has been re relatively dispersed. All right, so you also have a number of attempts to reform the Ottoman structure starting in the 1740s um, because there's a period of peace from 1739 until the 1760s for the Ottoman Empire. While most of Europe was in the middle of wars like, uh, like for example, the Seven Years' War or the War of Austrian Succession, uh, the Ottoman Empire stayed out of those conflicts and therefore was in a, was in a peaceful period. Um, and so we begin to see several things starting to arise. The first one is that um, a new, new sets of universities are founded based on Western models, like Istanbul Technical University, in order to teach uh, more modern versions of math and science. We also see the construction of a military academy inside the Istanbul Technical University, where the language of instruction is in French, and French uh, because of the historic relationship between France and the Ottoman Empire. And French military instructors are brought in uh, to teach how artillery is supposed to fire and work. You also have Ibrahim Mutaferika. Um, he was a, a Hungarian uh, by ethnicity who converted to Islam. He was originally a unit, uh, he was originally a Protestant Hungarian. Um, and he brought with him to Constantinople a printing press. Now, there had been printing presses in the Ottoman Empire before this point, but those were run by Jews. Uh, primarily the Jews, uh, the Sephardic Jews from Spain had brought them with them in 1497. But Mutaferika was the first Muslim to want to use a printing press. And he did get some pushback from the ulama about it, but he got significantly more pushback from the calligraphers about it because it would destroy their monopoly on the book trade. Uh, that said, um, he was given permission to publish some non-Muslim books in the sense of they had no religious significance. And so um, 
you see the text that he printed on the right-hand side, which is a text on governance. Eventually, uh, the, the calligraphers and the ulama were able to consolidate power and destroy the printing press, and it wouldn't be another century until you had large-scale printing done by Muslims for other Muslims of non-Muslim, uh, of sorry, of, of, of non-religious texts. And during this period, we also see the beginning of private investment and changes in taxation. A lot of this happens in terms of the business and investment occurs in the coffee houses, uh, which you can see below. These are uh, basically the uh, the previous equivalent of Starbucks. You have uh, large areas for people to sit and discuss business. Remember also that um, pious Muslims are not supposed to drink. So even though drinking was certainly a part of Ottoman culture, they couldn't do it as much in the open as they could with coffee. And so coffee houses became these areas where business people would meet, discuss propositions, and then go about uh, forming new businesses. And so you created this sort of investment market. It was significantly less developed than the corollaries that we would see, especially in England, um, but it was much more advanced than anything in the Ottoman system beforehand. Um, I have a question that these were all male people in the coffee houses. Absolutely, the coffee houses were gender segregated. All right, so then we get to the Russo-Turkish War of 1768 to 1774. And the story of how this starts is kind of sad. Um, you have a situation where Cossacks are chasing Poles, right? They're, the Cossacks are fighting the Poles uh, in Poland and the Poles cross the border into the Ottoman Empire. And when they do this, um, they arrive in the city of Balta. Uh, the Cossacks chase them over the border and then decide to burn the city. Now, the Poles did this because Poland and the Ottoman Empire had a historic understanding. Um, but of course, the destruction of the city of Balta was a humiliation that the Ottoman Empire could not endure. And so we had the Ottoman Empire declare war on, the, on, on Russia as the result of several uh, diplomatic overtures that failed to receive restitution from the, uh, from the Russians in a meaningful way for the Cossack destruction. This war was absolutely devastating uh, to the Ottomans. Um, at first, the first major loss was the Battle of Cheshme. Cheshme is on the Anatolian coast. It's close to the modern city of Izmir. And the Ottoman Navy was destroyed uh, by the Russian Navy at this battle. Um, we also see um, General Suvorov, who's one of the greatest generals in history, um, fighting for the Russian Empire. And at the city of Kozluja, uh, he, wins, he wins an incredibly strong victory um, against the Ottomans. We also see um, Russian uh, policy being masterminded by a new leader in uh, Tsarina Catherine the Great's court. Uh, and this is Grigory Potemkin. Um, he uh, served alongside Suvorov in terms of coordinating attacks against the Ottoman population and ordered massacres in a number of the cities that were then taken, like Kozluja. We also uh, see that the treaty put the Ottoman Empire in such a desperate situation that they even asked the English to mediate uh, a treaty with the Russians for them. Um, and at this time, the Ottomans did not trust the English, but the English were willing to intervene and intercede. And so the Treaty of Kuchuk Kainarja was signed, which we'll discuss in a second. Uh, there's a question as to um, if this is the Potemkin of Potemkin villages, this is the very same. Although uh, there is, uh, although the historical sources seem to argue that uh, the, the story of Potemkin villages was actually a rumor created to discredit uh, Potemkin, that, that the villages that he showed uh, Tsarina Katerina uh, when he took her into the Crimea, we'll talk a little bit about that, were actually and, and, real villages. Yeah, and, and in terms of um, impact, um, Surov is just an incredible general. I mean, he, he absolutely is one of the greatest in, in history. And I mean, his, his, his life, his story, um, the techniques he used, which are, you know, basically still taught in terms of uh, teasing and small reconnaissance and scout forces having uh, different sized formations, 
at the at the point of of contact i mean it, it, you know he 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 was i mean truly you know 100 years ahead i mean he he would have been a a great general in the american civil war um you know and and i think that's he he, he in some ways he's sort of the ulysses s grant of 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 russia absolutely yeah I just wanted to add that uh, he actually had a rank uh, of generalissimus which is like yep. the highest rank ever and there were like i don't know maybe only two or three uh, uh maybe another i know only of one other person who had that rank and that was stalin uh you know but we <laughs> I, I don't think it was deserved but uh, uh that's why he was very much um above any general in in russian history and uh he hasn't lost even one battle yeah uh, it's exactly. and managed yeah so he is he is really one of the greatest uh generals uh, uh of all times one one of them of course uh, yeah i mean i and and i think one of the things to, to just recognize is just how uh you know from the time he was 16 17 he 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 started fighting all the way through the you know really his whole his whole life and uh and and that and that winning and losing goes all the way back to him being 16, 17, 18. I mean, it, it, it really is sort of remarkable. It's almost like you, if you saw that on a movie, you wouldn't believe it. Um, yeah. Anyway. yeah. The other one, I just realized that there was a, another journalist who was also undeserved, which is uh, Alexander Menshikov, who yeah. was a <laughs> personal friend of uh, Peter the Great, uh, but uh, not necessarily a great general. He's the only great general who had that rank in Russia. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, the, uh, but what's important is after this battle, because of how effectively Suvorov had fought and, and how destroyed the Ottoman Navy was at the Battle of Cheshme, um, this Treaty of Kuchuk Kainarja um, made a number of demands on the Ottomans, although interestingly, very few in terms of territory. So they wanted a, uh, an indemnity, but several important things to point out. The Crimean Khanate was made independent, by which that means that it was no longer a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire, and it was free to choose to whom it would serve loyally. Of course, uh, we should not be surprised that it becomes a vassal state of Russia within a few years and gets conquered by Russia in 1783. We also see that the Ottomans are asked to renounce uh, Kobardia, Kabardia. Kabardia is a territory in the Caucasus, uh, just north of the Caucasus Mountains, and it was a coastal territory along the Black Sea, which would give uh, the Russians increased coastal access and an easier hand dealing in uh, with the numerous tribes that were going to get to the Caucasus soon. It secured a Russian passage through the Bosphorus, um, but, uh, and sorry, and even though uh, the Crimean Khanate was independent, and even if they came under Russian authority, um, prayers for the Ottoman Caliph as the leader of Islam uh, were still permitted in uh, Russian-controlled Crimea. And finally, the Russians were able to visit Jerusalem. But the biggest piece was that the Russian government now became the official advocates of the Orthodox millet uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Remember, the Orthodox millet is at least 25%, if not more, of the population of the entire empire. And now the Russian Tsar has permission to speak on behalf of the interests and desires of this population. So any issue that uh, the Tsar sees, he can escalate uh, in, uh, to the Ottomans. And this creates a lever internally in the Ottoman system for Russian control. And, and I think one other thing that is incredibly substantial that doesn't get really much discussion is that the uh, Russian Navy, Imperial Navy now uh, can go into the Med. I mean, the, the fact that they can actually traverse the Mediterranean or at least the, the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, it shows that, you know, in essence, the Ottomans are, uh, you know, in essence, becoming enveloped. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's like the, the concept of the snake. Um, and of course, there's another war. Uh, 
because that's one what they the like thing, to do. <laughs> yeah. No, so one of the things that we're that we're starting to see is that there's a period of peace and then a, and then a period of war and then a period of peace and a period of war. And it's really important to understand these sort of wars as almost almost one war with intermissions, um, because the aims of these wars, the Russian expansion towards the Black Sea, the population growth with inside of inside of Russia, the advance of their uh, military industrial complex much more quickly than that of the Ottomans. Um, results in these repetitive engagements as Russia is expanding. Um, and so in the war of 1787 to 1792, uh, this is prompted again by uh, a number of actions by Tsarina, uh, Katerina of Russia. So she goes to Crimea and you can see her on, on her trip to Crimea. This is the trip that spawned the term Potemkin village, even though Potemkin showed her only things that he had actually built. And while she was there, she decided to promote her Greek project, uh, which, uh, which is where she argued that she would take significant territories from the Ottomans and incorporate them into Russia, give her son Constantine um, territories in Ottoman Rumelia, uh, give uh, uh, Grigor Potemkin his own uh, state of Dacia, which was uh, Romania, and uh, reward the Austrians for going along with the project. And of course, the Ottomans found this deeply insulting that uh, their territory would be carved up like such. And if I may add, this is really the basis of why Russians took Crimea back, because That's right. from this time on, you know, they consider it to be a, a, a Russian uh, territory. And uh, uh, by the way, Potemkin uh, built the city called Sevastopol. That's where the Russian fleet right now. Uh, probably the most significant city in uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, so from there on, from the end of the 18th century, uh, it used to be a territory of uh, Russia. And that was really the basis why Russians coveted uh, 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 this island. Uh, of course, strategic uh, reasons too, but yeah. historical. And, 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 and one other piece is that this is also uh, uh, Potemkin created or you know, um, expanded the Russian Imperial Navy uh, to create what was the Black Sea Fleet. Yeah, yeah. So the, he basically the, created Black Sea F Fleet. That's what that's they call. Right. He, he that's built exactly it. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And and so that then that fleet is truly a ocean going fleet, right? And 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 that is a you know a historic shift of Russian uh, projection of power, uh, different than just having a a regional navy, and so, and that obviously, as as Greg, you know, properly pointed out, is uh, linked to a huge amount of the uh, conflict today, uh, for obvious reasons. Now, in uh, now in the conflict, uh, the British and the French had said that they would be allies of the Ottoman Empire, but did not intervene at all, and uh, and Prussia also made guarantees of defending the Ottoman Empire and did not intervene. So the Ottomans were on their own against the Russians who were able to make a number of sieges, launching amphibious attacks from that fleet based in Crimea. Um, one, uh, one of the most prominent was the siege of Ochakov, uh, uh, which recovered uh, the fortress from Ottoman control and the siege of Ismail. Both of these cities, Ochakov and Ismail, are in the territory of what is now Ukraine. Um, close to the city of Odessa, if you're familiar with that city. In terms of the land that the Russians got from the Treaty of Yashi, um, it's actually not a large uh, swath of territory. It's that green area that's, uh, that's hatched uh, the, with, the, with the striped lines in the map in the upper right-hand side. But what this war really demonstrated was that, the, was that the Black Sea was no longer an area of Ottoman control. It was an area of Russian control and freedom of movement for them. The destruction of the Ottoman fleet at the Battle of Cheshma in 1770 uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the battles here really showed that it was the Russians who now controlled the Black Sea. Um, I have a question. Did Victoria's assort uh, marital alliances create the inactivity of those allies? Um, no. Uh, the only picture I could find of the British imperialists uh, is like sitting around the table with other imperialists was this picture of Victoria. Uh, Victoria was not queen at this time. That that's uh, she would live about a hundred years later. And 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 to give credit, um, you know, the greatest uh, Russian admiral um, uh, Ushkov was the 
you know, was, was, was the uh, winner of that, of that conflict. And so you have this period where, and you just can't, you know, really emphasize this enough where you had, you know, the greatest Russian um, naval and, and, and land commanders, arguably in history, and, and some of the greatest ones in history, all within this very tight window of time, at the same time going up in essence against the same enemy. Um, you know, while the empire at this point, you know, over that, that prior hundred years had, you know, radically expanded. I mean, it's, it's, a uh, you know, I think everybody could see the writing on the wall and, and it, it does explain this shift in English and French thinking too, right? A hundred years earlier, you know, Hey, let's use this, this growing Russian, uh, you know, pseudo empire, you know, to our benefit. And now it's okay, we are going to have to deal and contain <laughs> this larger Russian empire. Um, right, that they're, they're becoming an equal party at the table, and we don't know absolutely. what they're going to do. Absolutely. So yeah. now, just one little comment, uh, just since we talk about the empire, the, the first title of emperor was assumed by Peter the Great. And from there on, uh, uh, Russia was considered to be an empire. I mean, it was a, a self-proclaimed, but yep. it happened. As all time. empires are. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the empire of Greg, right? <laughs> when, once we get to the end of the 18th century, uh, we have Sultan Selim III. Um, and Selim III really wanted to create a modern uh, Ottoman military to deal with um, to uh, sorry, I have a question. The British and French would have been largely focused on North America in this period. Um, not so much North America alone. North America was certainly important. You have the Seven Years' War, but you also have a lot of focus on India. The British are trying to overthrow uh, Tipu Sultan of Mysore. And you have um, the British interests in securing the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and eventually they're going to start looking at the Ottomans as a way of uh, securing that. So, uh, and, and you have this, and you have these two little things going on called the, uh, French and the American revolution. So, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely, they've got their hands full. Yeah. They got their hands full. <laughs> so, uh, at the end of the 1700s, you had, as I said, Salim the third and Salim the third, uh, was trying to, uh, modernize the military system of the Ottoman Empire once again, right? We had those reforms from Ahmed III at the beginning of the century, now at the end of the century, beginning of the next century. Selim III takes up the charge again, and he creates the nizam i jadid or the new system. Um, and in the nizam i jadid um, he wants a modern standard military. So he begins another large-scale draft, and he brings in French uh, leaders who can teach. Again, France is the historic ally of the Ottoman Empire, and so it's a natural call to bring in French experts who will teach the Levenler, these draftees, uh, how to uh, operate and fire a gun. And in several of the engagements of, uh, of, sorry, of the previous uh, Turkish war, they did much better uh, than the Janissary Corps. And so the Janissaries began to see them as a threat. And so in 1807, uh, they revolted against Selim III and installed uh, Mustafa IV as the Sultan. But, uh, and Mustafa IV had to agree that he would disband the nizam i jadid um, and restore the Janissaries to their rightful place as the dominant uh, elite military uh, contingent in the Ottoman military. Now, in order to finance all these changes, Selim III had also alienated many of the Timariot. Um, and he did this because, as we discussed last time, the Timars are a usufruct, meaning that the person who owns a Timar doesn't actually own the land. They own the right to profit from the land. And the ownership still resides with the Sultan, which means that the Sultan can revoke or exchange the Timar uh, for somebody else. And so that's exactly what Selim III did. And so he pulled many Timariots off their land by giving it to somebody else who he thought would be more productive with it and therefore gained additional tax revenues. Um, you can understand, of course, why the Timariot would, uh, would support the Janissary revolts to remove Selim III from power in the possible idea that they might get their land back. 
Now, Mustafa IV didn't survive for very long. There were a number of more modernist elements in the government. And so his uh, inability uh, to progress the Ottoman Empire led to another coup in which he was removed and Mahmoud II was put in power. Now, as you can tell from Mahmoud II's dress, um, he was in, uh, in favor of, in, of changing uh, the Ottoman Empire and westernizing to a degree uh, more similar to Peter the Great. And in, uh, and in two or three weeks, when we get to the internal reforms of the Ottoman Empire, we'll see the reforms that Mahmoud II put in, uh, put in place that would bring the Ottoman Empire closer to being the equal of Russia, even though they don't come uh, close enough to actually bridge the gap. All right. Now, one of the interesting things, and we'll talk more about this in two weeks, um, are Napoleon's wars. As I mentioned, the French had been the historic allies of the Ottoman Empire, but um, the French invaded Egypt uh, after their French Revolution, led by Napoleon. Um, and in order to counter Napoleon, um, the Ottoman Empire switched sides and made an alliance with the British. Um, and so the British helped the Ottomans resecure Egypt. But then a few years later in 1805, uh, Napoleon won the Battle of Austerlitz. And Selim III decided to gamble on the fact that, um, that Napoleon would be victorious. And now that Napoleon was no longer in Egypt, the British had routed him from Egypt. Um, he then switched his alliance to France. Well, he forgot that the British Navy was all over um, all of his major ports, and the British destroyed the Ottoman fleet in 1807 for allying with Napoleon. And uh, the Russians, who were also part of an anti-Napoleon alliance that was uh, that was uh, brewing, especially in the late in 1810 and onwards, you begin to have Russian invasions of the Ottoman Empire uh, taking place. Um, as part of the Ottoman push to get the French and their allies out of the Russian empire. And in particular, we have General Mikhail Kutuzov um, who launches the Battle of Slobozia. Now Slobozia, you can see is a Romanian town on the north bank of the Danube. You can see in this picture, you can see Slobozia from the Bulgarian side on the Southern bank. Can I um, add another uh, small piece of information? Sure. Uh, uh, it's kind of relevant because just uh, uh, in 1805, there was a famous battle of Austerlitz that also Russian troops uh, participated in that. Uh, of course, they lost. Uh, I mean, it was combined effort, uh, but it, it is depicted in the war and peace of uh, mm -hmm. Tolstoy. That's where the uh, Andrei Balkonsky was wounded. You know, that was in 1805 battle of Austerlitz. So Russians already participated in this uh, anti-Napoleon coalition. That's sure. All. But, but as a result of Austerlitz, uh, the Russians made peace with Napoleon. And then when they couldn't uh, continue with Napoleon's required trade embargo, um, uh, Napoleon declared war on them, um, which resulted in the Russians trying to expel the French and any allies of the French, which included the Ottomans at this point. The Battle of Slobozia was a huge victory for the Russians. They lost fewer than 300 people, uh, but they removed tens of thousands of Ottomans from the field. And it was such a devastating uh, loss that uh, the Ottomans signed away all of Bessarabia. Uh, you can see that on the map. Um, Bessarabia is uh, the country of Moldova and some parts of what's now Ukraine. Um, and they signed that over to the Russians uh, in order to stop a, f a further invasion uh, into Bulgarian territory. And, and, and there is sort of um, a dimension there, even into, into today's world, where uh, Russian um, support and, and, and Russian speakers and even Russian forces are there. And, and that one isn't necessarily linked back to here, but it's linked back to World War II, um, when because you had a pretty substantial battle there uh, between the Russians and the, and the, and the Germans. And so there's... Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, what you would call almost, uh, you know, blood soil or, or land and blood, uh, a, a connection. Mm -hmm. So now we move to the revolutions 
Uh, now, we're going to talk about the Balkan revolutions in a lot more detail next week, but for here, it matters that the Russians saw themselves as the defenders of the Orthodox peoples in the Ottoman Empire. And that was the right that they had gotten under the Treaty of Kuchu Kainarja that we talked about uh, earlier. So when the Greeks were revolting, uh, the Ottoman Empire was trying to put down the rebellion, and it took them seven years, and they were finally on the cusp of doing so when the British intervened. Now, from the British perspective, uh, they actually, uh, the government wanted the Ottoman Empire to succeed in putting down the Greek revolt, because they considered that Russian supported Greece would be a further uh, destabilizing of the balance of power. That said, the Greek revolt, as opposed to the revolts of other um, peoples in the Balkans, like the Serbs or like the Bulgarians, um, was a revolt that inspired people in the West because of what were called Philhellenic societies. These were organizations that promoted uh, the Greek contribution to Western civilization. Um, and you even had Philhellenes or Greek lovers making their way to Greece. You can see um, Lord Byron, uh, the English poet, uh, coming to meet the Greek rebels and Misolonghi. Um, and uh, of course, the Greeks that he found were not the Greeks of his imagination, not the Greeks of the Acropolis. But you can see the way he's dressed here is because he expects to find the Greeks almost in togas. Because <laughs> that's how people roll in the 19th century. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, because of this public relations nightmare, the British decide to support the Greeks. And so there's a British and French Navy that arrives and puts down the Ottoman slash Egyptian uh, military. We'll talk a little bit um, next week about why it's, why it's a mix um, and definitely in two weeks about that. And so after the Battle of Navarino in 1827, which is a, a thorough naval victory by the British, um, Greece becomes effectively independent. It first becomes independent as a republic, but the great powers of Europe will not stand for a republic on European soil. And so they appoint a king, a Bavarian king uh, for the Greeks. Now, We've talked about what's been going on on the European side, but we haven't really talked about what's been going on on the Asian side. So it take, it's worth taking some time to go through that. The Russians were advancing in the Caucasus from the late 1700s onward. And they really made their biggest gains um, by first reaching out, uh, sorry, by first uh, their contact with the Georgians. Now you have the King of Kartli Kacheti, um, which is one of the Georgian states, um, uh, Arekle II, um, trying to reach out to the Russians and get a treaty of protection um, when the Persian Empire was weak, because the Persian Empire was the typical uh, country to which Georgia was a vassal, uh, especially Eastern Georgian states like Kartli Kacheti. But uh, given the Orthodox Church that the Georgians and the Russians shared in common, and the Russian advocacy for the Orthodox in the Balkans, um, you have this outreach from um, uh, King Oratle II, um, and that becomes the Treaty of Georgievsk, um, which you can see there, uh, that unites the two countries in sort of in somewhat of an alliance. We also see that uh, the Russians begin to push down further into the Caucasus region by conquering territories of both the Ottomans and the Persians. Um, they defeat the Ottomans in 1829. Uh, and signed the Treaty of Adrianople and had defeated the, uh, the Persians one year earlier uh, in Turkmenchai in 1828. And so now they controlled uh, most of uh, the Caucasus. In fact, the borders that they took at this point are roughly analogous to the borders that Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan have with the modern countries of Turkey and Iran. Um, the Russians were able to launch massive sieges against Georgian fortresses like a Khaltsikhe, um, what are today known as Armenian fortresses in Georgia, like Akhalkalaki, um, and we begin the process of Armenification. I have a question, did Navarino remain a strategic naval defense position into World War II? Um, I believe so, but uh, I don't know for certain. Yeah, I mean, it did into, into in, yeah, absolutely, into World War II. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So, in terms of the Armenian repatriation, this is sort of an interesting phenomenon. Um, what ends up happening is that the Russians take 
the region that we now know as Armenia it was called Erivan Khanat at the time. And they begin to provide incentives for Armenians to move to Erivan Khanat. That's not to say that Armenians didn't have a long history and past there. We, just, we covered that in uh, episodes 22 and 23 of this series. Um, but by this time, the population was 80% uh, Muslim. Um, and the Russian incentives for immigration, you can see the places to which our, uh, Armenians immigrated to, um, the blue is some of the older immigration, uh, the brown comes afterwards, then the yellow, then the orange, in terms of time. Um, these Armenian immigrations led to Erivan Khanat becoming majority Armenian by the end of the 19th century. Um, and this is very similar, you can imagine, uh, to what happened uh, in the nascent state of Israel in the 20th century, right? You had the Zionist movement bringing lots of people into the state, and so eventually they become a majority. Um, now, the difference is that the Armenians became a majority before uh, any wars over their territory, um, whereas in Israel it happened after. But uh, the interesting thing here is that the Russians were establishing this Christian majority region on the border with the Ottoman Empire and uh, the Persian Empire in order to effectively uh, garris have a garrison and area of control along that area, right? The Georgians and the Armenians would effectively serve as the first line of defense against the Ottomans and the Persians in the Caucasus. But it's not just Georgians and Armenians who are in the Caucasus, so it's worth taking a few seconds to really realize just how diverse uh, this area is. And you can see from the linguistic perspective, you already have uh, five or six different language families. Um, and these language families and groups are crowded into the area of the Caucasus. Now, I want to uh, pay particular attention to the uh, tribes that are described in the lower left-hand side, as well as the region of Dagestan. So let's start with the map first. You can see Dagestan is north of Azerbaijan, um, close to the coast with the Caspian Sea. And Dagestan was one of the areas with the longest exposure um, to those who were south of the Caucasus Mountains because there was a pass uh, along the Caspian Sea that would connect uh, Dagestan to those areas. And so Dagestanis were more likely to be Muslim than the other peoples in the Caucasus. You have the Ossetians who were a natural uh, Russian ally living in the lowland regions um, uh, in these mountains and also uh, being uh, Christian by religion. You have the Circassians, um, who are uh, a number of different tribes, especially in the Western part. Uh, on this map, they're identified as Adige, Cherkis, uh, yeah, Adige and Cherkis. Um, so you can see that sort of dark burgundy and uh, red color um, in the uh, Western regions of Adige and um, Karachay Cherkesia. You can also see the Kabardians. The Kabardians are related to the Circassians, and in fact, in many cases, um, they are considered Circassians, but the delineation is important because the Kabardians live in the lowland regions, whereas the, most of the Circassians live in more highland regions, and they control lots of territory, relatively speaking. And then, of course, you have uh, the Chechen people. Um, you can see the Chechens on this map sort of in that tawny, um, yellowish tan color, very close to Dagestan. And by this point, um, as is today, uh, most Chechens are Muslim. So let's get into this a little bit more in depth. So we look at this map from, uh, from 1767, and you will be required to remember all of these states. Um, and that's gonna be on the quiz. Um, so you have a number of these different states. And as I pointed out, uh, Derbent, um, which was in uh, the region of Dagestan was really the doorway into the Caucasus, the Northern Caucasus from the Middle East. And so you had a large Muslim population there. At this point, you also have uh, the development of Sufism really starting to spread throughout uh, the Caucasus region. Um, you can see there you have the Nokcho. A Nokcho is the Chechen name for Chechen people. So, uh, and they're doing what's called dhikr which is where Sufis recite the different names of God in order to put themselves in spiritual ecstasy. 
And these Sufi rituals become very common throughout these mountainous areas. And Sufism tends to overlay with a number of the syncretic faiths that already exist. Uh, probably the most famous of these is the Khabze, um, or the Khabze Adige um, of the Circassian people. Um, and so you begin having sort of a mix of these uh, traditions. Of course, as we move later and later in history, uh, the Islam becomes more orthodox. We also have a huge nobility system that exists, especially in Kabardia, um, where the nobility are able to extract large taxes uh, from the poor. And in order to oppose this, the, Sufi, uh, the Sufis begin criticizing this system and pushing for increased egalitarianism. In fact, Circassia undergoes a revolution around 1780 in order to institute a republic um, where everybody has democratic rights. It's one of the interesting things that generally speaking, guns uh, have had the ability to centralize large empires and give power to those who already possess it. In the Caucasus region, the implementation of guns becomes one of the quickest ways uh, for smaller groups to achieve their own defense because they're finally able to match their adversaries uh, in terms of firepower where they don't have size. You also, as a result of these Sufis, have the creation of the Nawab or Naib, um, and the Nawab are deputies. These deputies sit in a number of different tribes and can communicate with each other um, without disrespecting the distinctions between the various Caucasian tribes. Now, as Russia moves further south, uh, they begin to attack and colonize um, these areas of the Northern Caucasus. And these areas take longer to pacify from the Russian perspective than do the large scale empires of the Persians and the Ottomans in this region. Um, and the Russians are helped in this by the fact that a number of Cossacks had already moved beyond the Terek River, which puts them in the Caucasus region. And these uh, Cossacks uh, were the primary uh, shock force that the Russians used in order to intimidate and destroy uh, and massacre a number of these Caucasian tribes. These Caucasian tribes would defend themselves by building an all, which is a walled city. So originally the cities already existed, but they would build these incredibly high defensive walls and equipped with guns. They were able to resist uh, for a significant amount of time. The Russians were only really able uh, to begin to penetrate the territories through the creation of the Georgian military road, which still exists today and connects uh, Tbilisi in, uh, in, uh, on, in Georgia on the southern side of the mountains with the rest of Russia. And you can see a postcard from the Georgian military road below. You had a number of different uh, leaders from among the different Caucasian tribes who all started to band together um, in order to avoid and defeat uh, the Russians. Eventually, of course, they all failed, but uh, it's worth taking a second to talk about them. On the right-hand side, you can see Kazbech Tzgolzhiko. And uh, Kazbech um, was a Circassian. Uh, he fought uh, until 1840 when he died, but uh, he served from 1810 when he was part of, uh, he was one of the few nobles uh, among the Circassians who fought for the Circassian Republic, for the Circassian democracy. Most of the nobles, of course, uh, were opposed to the democracy. But after that, uh, he uh, fought numerous raids against the Russians, uh, trying to prevent the Russians from taking Adige, uh, the Circassian homeland. And on the left of him, you have Imam Shamil. Um, Shamil um, was uh, a leader from Dagestan, uh, who managed to bring a lot of these Nawab, these deputies, um, into an informal alliance called the Caucasian Imamate. And they resisted uh, Russian control for decades before in 1859, Shamil was brought before the Russians and surrendered. Um, considering how illustrious his military career had been in the mountains, um, the Russians allowed him the ability um, to live out his days in exile. Oh, if I may add, uh, Shamil is the inspiration of Chechen resistance. He is considered the great Chechen leader. I mean, uh, Dagestan, Chechen, they are very close. But, uh, you know, because of his stiff resistance during the Russian-Chechen wars, I mean, he was the great inspiration for the resistance. Yes, exactly. 
Um, uh, there's a question of whether the, the picture of Imam Shamil is a photograph. Um, I think it is. Uh, we're starting to get into the age when photographs do exist. So that may well be a portrait. Now, after the alls were broken down, you had a number of massacres. And so you had mountain people leaving those alls. And the mountain people leaving those alls led to the Circassian genocide, uh, also known um, as uh, the Tzitzekun, um, or tragedy uh, in, in uh, the Circassian language. In this, um, about 100,000 um, Circassians survived in the homeland. About 700,000 to 800,000 were uh, massacred. Um, and another 700 to 800,000 uh, were deported uh, mostly to the Ottoman Empire. And it's worth pointing out that the journey to the Ottoman Empire was also very dangerous. A number of uh, boats uh, were either shipwrecked or uh, there weren't enough provisions to get across, never mind the difficulty of moving down the mountains. So, the, uh, so this genocide um, became uh, it, very uh, disruptive to the Circassian community. And there are actually now more Circassians by a significant margin in Turkey today than there are in uh, the historical homeland. That said, the Turks did not try to establish Circassian communities. They actually put the Circassians wherever they felt they needed more demographic assistance. And so they would evict Christians from their home. And, or, and, and you can see, for example, this is a case where Bulgarians were evicted from their home to make way for Circassians to live there. Um, so these Circassians were used as sort of a Muslim surrogate people uh, who would be dependent on the Ottoman state um, in terms of where they were resettled. Additionally, because of uh, Turkification policies in the 1930s, and we'll discuss those when we finally get to that time period, um, the Circassian genocide and, its, and the discussion about it in Turkey was largely muted. Um, and of course, in Russia, um, there's an abject refusal to recognize the Circassian genocide. Um, so uh, it's not until the 1990s that the Circassian community has begun to request uh, acceptance of the genocide. And today, uh, only one nation, Georgia, uh, uh, accepts uh, the Tsitsikun or uh, Circassian genocide as having factually occurred. Um, I have a question of, are these Circassians the same prehistoric people as the horse-based nomads in Western Ukraine? I'm not familiar of Circassians being horse-based nomads. I think maybe you're confusing them with the Scythians. Um, uh, there was a, a, the comment, the previous slide seemed reminiscent of anti-Jewish programs occurring in Russia in the same period. Is there any relationship between the two assaults and genocides? Um, I would say that in regards to the pogroms, those were the Cossacks um, attacking Jewish communities um, with almost Russian permission, but not direct Russian command. Um, in this case, the Russian government was ordering the Cossacks to attack these alls and take, and take the booty for themselves. Um, and I wouldn't say that there's a connection between the genocides other than that. And we'll get to the Crimean War next week, I guess. So um, there was one other thing from last week that I thought might be interesting to those of you who want to stay for a little bit. Um, and it was the question on the Deadlands. Um, you can remember from the Ottoman land categories, you have these Arazi Mavet, uh, the, the Deadlands. And this is actually something that has come to the fore in the modern state of Israel. Um, you have these dead lands. Um, uh, you have, sorry, Israeli law is a British overlay on former Ottoman laws. And so you have this sort of joint legal system in Israel. And when Israel conquered the West Bank, um, they used these Arazi Mavet um, to take, because right, Arazi Mavet under the Ottoman system means that land reverts to the Sultan because it's not being used. The Israeli government has argued that the land in the West Bank that was not privately owned um, should revert to the Sultan, which in this case, of course, is Israel. Um, and so Israel then has the ability to give out um, Timars, for want of a better term, because Israeli uh, land owning policy is not to own it. Isn't, you don't own land. You have a, you have a lease and you have usufruct but the land remains that of the Israeli government, even in proper Israel, which is why most Israelis have 99 year leases. 
And so effectively, Israel gives Timars on the re, uh, retaken Arazi Mavet um, in order to uh, create the settlements. All right, um, so I guess, um, and as I said before, um, this presentation and next week will still be on Tuesday, but um, the week after that, we will meet on the 10th of March, uh, the Thursday, and we will continue meeting on Thursdays from that point onwards. Uh, Mark, I see your hand. Sorry about that. Yeah. Mark? Uh, it's not allowing me. I, or can, can you hear me now? We hear you. Oh, okay, awesome. Um, I was really intrigued by uh, something you said a little bit earlier about these uh, Sephardic Jews from Spain bringing printing presses into the Ottoman Empire. And I had to I had to look it up, but I thought I, I was um, I, I I didn't I thought that was too early. But it, there's got to be a story of Gutenberg inventing his press. What 1450? I think. Yeah. I think it's 1454, if memory serves. Yeah. And then um, then within four decades, you've got Jews from Spain evacuating Spain, but taking printing passes. I mean, that's it seems an awfully quick thing to go from, what was it, Mainz, I think, to to um, uh, to Spain. And then they, you know, there must have been, there must be a story there that the Jews, for the, the Spanish Jews to have adopted uh, the printing press so quickly. It wasn't actually just the Jews. Um, in Spain, in general, the printing press had been adopted. Um, what, what the Jews did that was interesting was they were the first ones to develop new characters for the movable type. Because, of course, Jews were printing in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, even when they were printing Ladino, which is, of course, a relative of Spanish, they were printing it with Hebrew letters. So they had to figure out, he uh, they had to modify the movable type so they could print in Hebrew letters. But, um, hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they they had the uh, in Spain they the technology was not common but it was it was extant. Um, well, I, yeah. Oh, and, uh, and one other quick point is that there was a massive period of a uh, of Jewish expulsion in in the in the Holy Roman Empire, which of course landed them in Spain, and they brought obviously the that transmission of technology with them. And so, and then of course they had the same thing in Spain. Um, huh, thanks. thanks. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll put, uh, there's a paper here that I dug up because I do obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, I have a question as to whether I'll cover Shabbat Tzvi. Um, Shabbat Tzvi was definitely in the Caprulu Sultanate time period. Um the Caprulu Vizier time period, which which we did last week, um, I didn't cover him uh, primarily because while it's very momentous for the Jewish community um, as an overall Ottoman phenomenon, it's quite small. Um, but I have talked about him before in some of my discussions on the history of Zionism, um, which are really old, but they're in that playlist that I provided at the beginning of the lecture. Um, so if you click on that playlist and you go to the first um, lecture on the history of Zionism, it should be there probably around the end of the first hour, beginning of the second hour. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I think if that's it. Um, Great job, Richard, like usual. Thank you. Yeah, um, very good. So I think because the Crimean War fits in more naturally um, when we talk about the Tansy Met reforms and all that other discussion, because of it, it'll be in that time period, I think I'll push it to then. But um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's a it's a good place to stop actually.